This is DJ Johnny at JDMFM and today I'm here at Banky. Um, no, I'm not actually at Banky. I'm actually in my house, locked down due to COVID and coronavirus challenges. What a world we're living in at the moment. Nobody can get out and hence I can't get out to go to Banky to do my videos. But what I should say, first of all, is well done and thank you to all the NHS staff who are working for us to help save lives and also to all the key workers who are there in the shops and everywhere else who are also helping to keep us going. Such challenging times at the moment, but thank you very much for everything you're doing. Anyway, this video. Well, I can't obviously get out. I have done some videos before the lockdown and hopefully I'll try and use those, but you'll have to bear with me a little bit. I'm gonna to have to use quite a few photographs and things. But nonetheless, I hope it doesn't spoil your enjoyment too much. This video is going to be split into two little videos about soap and water. There's just so much to include. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it and uh, whatever you do, stay safe. So this is my third video in the Banky series, which is in Warrington. In this one, I'm going to be covering something called soap and water, which is actually all about the soap works uh, at Banky. There's two soap works, there was actually Joseph Crossfield and there was Lever Brothers as well. And in this short video, we're going to see, going to cover what I can. It's only going to be a snapshot of, um, of the history that's there, but uh, it certainly went from strength to strength to what it is, to a huge multinational organisation of today. So let's start the journey. Soap manufacture has been hugely important to the industrial growth of Warrington uh, and particularly around Banky. The first view that rail travellers will see is the view you can see me behind uh, from Banky station where they see the huge towers and the, the chimneys from Lever Brothers as it is on that side. It's been make, they've been making soap here as I say for over 200 years and they make a whole range of well-known household products, soaps and detergents as well as chemicals. Uh, but how did this all begin? So this is another map of Banky, the Banky area. This was taken in 1826. You remember my previous one, the Domba Van one, the 1772 map? This is now the follow on. You can see that Banky has grown a little bit. It's got a little bit more industry. The glass works there has got three chimneys now. It's only used to have two. Patterns Copperworks is now disused, it's not used anymore, but there is actually a cotton mill there. It didn't last very long, but there was certainly a cotton mill there. You can also see just over there on the right shoulder, that's Key Fold, where we were last time, and you can also see Lytton's Mill, Lytton's Corn Mill, which we spoke about again. Now the interesting thing is that Joseph Crossfield decided to uh, buy his first factory here and build his first factory here on the banks of the River Mersey and really, really important. And that's where this waterway was so important to all the products and the materials, everything else for the factories that were set up on this site. He could set the site up because it was connected to all the canals in the Northwest of, of, of England as well. So it meant that as well as the Mersey, he could then transport goods across the country and beyond. Amazing. And you can actually see Joseph Crossfield's works, which is just, just there. Um, at that point, and it's right, right next to a wharf. Pottery Wharf. Huh? Pottery Wharf? What's all that about? Well, there was actually a pottery factory there as well, would you believe? Uh, again, didn't last very long, but it was there. So in 1814, when Joseph Crossfield was only 21 years old, he bought a disused iron foundry and wire mill on the banks of the River Mersey at Banky. He had a little bit of help from his father who gave him about £1,500 to help set up the business. It was an absolutely perfect location for this new soap and candle works which he set up. The canals which were there were ideal to help uh, transport the raw materials and the finished products out. 
It could get coal from St Helens and Haydock. It could get salt from the Cheshire salt fields. And also it had a huge wharf there, Pottery Wharf, where he could load and unload a hundred ton vessels. Salt was in huge demand in the Industrial Revolution in those days. It was growing and also because of the Northwest textile trade, which was all around the area, uh, they needed soap everywhere. Not to mention the domestic market. Private enterprise was the, was the order of the day. It was the driving force of the Industrial Revolution and drove Joseph Crossfield wanted to make his mark in the manufacture of soap. This is Joseph Crossfield. <laughs> it's the best picture I could find. He was born above his father's grocery shop at 48 Sankey Street, Warrington on the 5th of October, 1792. The shop, as far as I can see, is around the same location as where the White Hart pub is of today on, on Sankey Street. Although his family was originally from Kendall, they moved from there to Warrington so that his father could set up this amazing grocery business. But they moved back in 1799 to Lancaster so his father could then set up a sugar refinery. He was into everything. Joseph, on the other hand, returned to Warrington in 1814, as I said before, to set up his salt making factory. It actually opened in 1815, a year later. Amazing. So in the 19th century, uh, soap and candles were growing commodities and Joseph Crossfield saw great opportunities in the manufacture of these products. He'd already done an apprenticeship in chemistry, so he knew all about how to make soap. It was really quite simple. All they needed was some tallow, which is beef fat at the time, uh, which would also be used to make candles. And they used palm oil from uh, overseas. Again, they could use the Mersey to come down from Liverpool for that. And alkali. Now, the alkali, that, which they used at first, was the ash, uh, was, was seaweed ash. Uh, later on they made their own, but first of all they used seaweed ash and the seaweed came from Scotland and Ireland again across the seas and down the Mersey to Banquet. They added lime to this to this ash uh, which was produced by, uh, by heating crushed limestone in a kiln. The whole mixture was then boiled up in huge copper pans and then salt added to separate the mixtures. The salt would come out separately and perfumes and colours were added and then they were all put into moulds and cut up into bars or blocks for sale. The higher quality soap, which sometimes some people wanted more quality, better quality soaps, uh, they used uh, more expensive uh, scents and dyes in these. So Joseph Crossfield also made soft soap or liquid soap and he made that using whale oil or seal oil. <gasps> Can you imagine using that today? I don't think so. He also used linseed oil in this as well. Now the candles were made from the same material as I said before, from the tallow and the palm oil, and they were an essential requirement for, for in the houses uh, and factories of the day before they had electricity. Blinky neck. And this is a picture of around 1854 of a soap maker. Can you see the huge copper pan where he's mixing all the tallow and all the alkali and all the chemicals together to make the soap? Now, one of the challenges that Joseph Crossfield and other soap makers of the time had was soap tax. Uh, soap tax? What's all that about? Yes, soap tax was, was charged on, uh, on all, the, all the products that were made. Now, it was Queen Anne who introduced it in 1712 because she thought it was a luxury item and also she needed some money to pay for the wars of the American colonies. So she introduced this soap tax. Now, to get the revenue on these, she sent a, a, a soap inspector or a tax inspector to the, uh, the factory to watch over when they made the soap. He was watching over it and he could calculate how much soap was made and how much tax should be paid. Can you imagine that? I suppose in a way, it's just like the alcohol tax of today. But the thing is that night time, he used to lock the, the soap pans up uh, so that nobody could get at them. And there was no illegal manufacture of soap. Blinky neck. Like. 
And this is a brilliant picture of the Crossfields works in about 1886. It really shows you what it used to look like in, the, in that year. You can see it's on the banks of the Mersey there, and you can see the boats berthed there, uh, waiting to, uh, to be loaded or unloaded. Uh, of course, that's that pottery wharf I mentioned before. Uh, you can also see there's, uh, there's a railway line there. That's called the Garston Railway, and Joseph Crossfield was very deeply involved with that. Uh, there's also Thatcher Lane. Can you see Thatcher Lane just there, just going along there, uh, which I mentioned last time. Uh, there, there it is alongside the buildings. And of course, around the buildings, there's lots of different factories within the factory, lots of the different uh, types of plant. There's a caustic plant, there's a glycerin plant, there's silicate plant, and lots, lots more. But you can see all the chimneys belching out the smoke and uh, all the soot and everything. You can imagine what it must have looked like and what it must have felt like living in those conditions in those days. There's also the tallow yard. Can you see this yard here? This all this uh, all these barrels and things like that along there. It's called the tallow yard. And that's full of the purest fat from England, Australia, North and South America. So obviously they, they brought that from abroad as well. They used palm oil, which is in some of those barrels, and there was coconut oil, and there was olive oil. But also there was the raw products that they needed. There's the coal, the salt, the seaweed I mentioned before, and lots, lots more. Amazing! There's not very many of the old Crossfields buildings left anymore, but I found one here which uh, looks like an old an old warehouse or old office block, I'm not sure. Um, but there's not the rest of it is all fairly modern plants, brand new uh, equipment for the chemicals of today that PQ Corporation manufacture. So sadly, Joseph Crossfield died in 1844, aged just 51 years old. No age at all. The business did continue, however, and it prospered with the help of his sons who took over the business. They continued to run it. And around 1860, it was one of the largest soap making factories in Britain. Crossfields were great innovators and pioneers in processing a wide range of chemicals, eventually becoming the main activity of the company. So they moved away from soap and went more into the chemical manufacture. They produced a wide range of chemicals from what used to be waste products really. Uh, they produced glycerine, paints, water treatment chemicals, caustic soda, silicate of soda and all sorts of other things. They were also pioneers in the large scale refining of vegetable oils and even producing palm butter which was used in the chocolate factories. Amazing! It was also the very first factory, we think in England, but maybe even the world, to have electricity for the power and everything else. And that was in 1883. Blinky heck! But in 1885, there was trouble ahead. Because William Lever, the guy who's behind me, Lord Leverhulme, as some might, might know him, and his brother, James, decided to build a rival soap factory right next door to Joseph Crossfield and Sons. Can you believe it? They bought an old chemical factory and redid it and they called it the Sunlight Soap Works, where Sunlight Soap was made. Well, that's the end of part A of Soap and Water. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I wonder what's going to happen to William Lever and Joseph Crossfield as they've set up these two uh, factories right next door to each other. But now it's time for a little break. Go and have a cup of tea and come back and watch part B a little bit later on. In part B, we'll find out what happened when William Lever set up his rival soap works at Banquet. And we'll also go back to Joseph Crossfield and to look at the, the war years associated with the, the whole site at Banquet. And we'll take a brief look at Warrington's famous Transporter Bridge. Anyway, whatever you're doing, hope you have a fabulous time and see you again very soon. Bye. <laughs>